Amen. Good night, everyone. It's nice that all of us could be here tonight to continue to study the Word of God. I'm happy to see the adults as well as the children. Now, children, Bible study is just as important as your practice. And so I expect you all to pay attention because there are a lot of stuff for you all to learn, okay? And if you all are going to be distracting to each other while I'm trying to teach, then I'm going to ask you to sit apart, okay? Okay, so pay attention and stay focused. And those of you who are outside, please join us on the inside. And as best as possible, try to ignore the noise across the street. Um, we're not able to tell people what to do, but um, we can focus and block out distractions and focus on what we should be focusing on here. We have reached uh, Galatians chapter uh, 2, verses 11. To 21 that's where we will be studying for tonight and I'm glad to see all of you those of you who have your Bibles feels free to open them up as we study together and those of you who don't then you're just gonna have to listen very attentively as I read and expound on them so that if you have questions or anything you'd like to ask you can feel free to do so amen Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through to 21. And we have been studying this book for the past couple of weeks now. We've been looking at matters pertaining to the gospel, the way we are saved or salvation. We're looking at the difference that existed between Jews as well as Gentiles and a number of other things and so I hope that as we continue to study we'll continue to grow we'll continue to learn and of course we'll continue to understand the Word of God much better so as much as you're able grasp the things that are being taught here in this book it's a profound and very important book in the New Testament and all of us as Christians are to learn the basic theology of it and the basic things that it talks about. So continue with verse 11. Paul says, When Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Now recall that Peter is a very important apostle. Peter was in the faith way before Paul. Peter knew Jesus face to face, walked with him for three and a half years, was specially chosen to take the gospel to the known world at that time. And Antioch was a significant place also for believers. It was there, according to Acts chapter 11, I think about verse 27, where... Uh, the disciples were first called Christians. Their faith in Christ, their preaching of the gospel and teaching about Jesus earned them the name of Christians. And here we have Paul confronting Peter in Antioch because Peter did something that he was uh, blameful for or he was to be blamed as Paul puts it in verse 12 he says for before certain men came from James he was eaten with the Gentiles James was another apostle before Paul he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem and they were still adhering to the old covenant law the law that the Jews were given and of course, the law created a wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were under the law. That was the covenant that God had made with them and their uh, fathers. And therefore, by obligation, they had to keep it. But the Gentiles who were not under the law, who God did not make this covenant with, 
they were not living according to the strictures of the law. Of course, there are certain things that are universe, commands that are moralistic in nature. For example, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't kill, don't covet. These things are inherent to us. According to Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through to 16, by nature, we know these moral laws and principles. But there are many laws of the law, agricultural laws, laws of diet, dressing, etc., that were peculiar to the Jews, that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. And so, before Peter was eating with these Gentiles, the reason he was able to eat with these Gentiles is because Peter got to understand that the peculiar diet of the Jews are no longer necessary. It's no longer necessary in New Covenant faith. When you read Levit Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14, you'll realize that certain animals they could have eaten, like chicken, uh, cows and goats and those kinds of animals, they could have eaten them. But they had to be prepared a certain way, all the blood drained out, etc. And there were regulations surrounding those as well. If those clean animals died naturally, the Jews couldn't eat them. Pigs, uh, uh, camel, um, rabbits, and those kinds of animals, they couldn't eat. But Gentiles were eating those things. If Jews ate those animals, or ate the clean animals the wrong way, they would be considered unclean. And so there was this wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21, God specifically said to them, if an animal that you can eat dies naturally, you can't eat it as a Jew, but you can give it to the Gentile or, or the resident alien who's among you, or you can sell it to a foreigner so that you wouldn't stand that great loss, but you yourself cannot eat it. And so Jews and Gentiles had different dietary rules that they followed. But in Jesus and New Covenant faith, Peter got to understand that as a Jew, these things are no longer in operation. Jesus has removed them. He has abolished them. For example, in Mark chapter 7, from verses 14 to about verse 22, when the situation with eating with unwashed hands came about, when the Pharisees had accused his disciples that they were eating with their hands unwashed, and the washing there wasn't mere hygienic washing where your hands dirty and you just wash it off in the sink. It was a ritualistic washing where you had to hold the cup a certain way and, and pour it over one hand. And then you had to use a napkin to hold that same cup and then pour it over that hand. You had to do that ritual about seven or eight times. It was a ritualistic kind of washing to clean themselves when they interacted with Gentiles, when they came from the market and all of these things so that they would not be considered unclean. Now Jesus used that scenario to teach that it is not what you ingest, what you eat that defiles you. He says, whatever goes into a man, it cannot defile him. It is what comes out, out of the heart, comes out adultery, murder, theft, foolishness, and all of these things, he says, come from within. And it is these things that defile a man. And then Mark chapter 7, verse 19, Mark adds an explanatory note to Jesus' statement by saying, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And so Peter and the Jewish disciples and apostles came to understand that in New Covenant faith, the New Covenant that Jesus has ushered in, these dietary rules don't matter any longer. And so he could sit down and eat with the Gentiles. Recall in Acts chapter 10, when God sent him to Cornelius' house, Peter didn't want to go at first. And so God showed him in a vision, great sheep led down from heaven with all kinds of animals, bunch of reptiles, birds, and unclean stuff. And the voice said to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. 
But Peter responded, not so, Lord, because from my youth I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. This happened three times. And God said to him, what God has cleansed, do not call common or unclean. And right after, Peter get to understand that three Gentile men came to see him who were unclean. And recall, Jews considered all non-Jews unclean by virtue of their diet, what they were eating. They were eating uh, uh, dogs and snakes and pig and all kinds of unclean animals culturally. And so Jews considered them unclean and they sought to avoid interaction with them by any means necessary and possible. So God here was showing Peter, I've ushered in a new covenant. I'm operating on a new basis and foundation. And these laws that you had before, they are no longer in operation. You can't separate yourself from people by the way they dress and the things they are eating. These things don't matter any longer. And so when Peter came to understand this, he went with them, went to Cornelius' house, explained to him, you know as a Gentile, and I'm a Jew, it is unlawful, it's against the law to come under your roof and to keep company with you. That's what he says in Acts 10, 28. But God has shown me that I must not call any man common or unclean. In other words, you're not unclean any longer by virtue of what you're eating. God has removed that barrier and now I can associate with you. We are one. This is why here Peter is freely eaten with these Gentiles in Antioch. And this was not a one-off thing. This was a consistent habit and practice of his. When he's among them, he is eating like them. He is dressing like them. He no longer considers himself and the Jewish law that he knew very well to be in operation and to be something that should separate Jews from Gentiles. He got to understand as Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 14 teach that Jesus has torn down the, the middle wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles and from the two people groups he has joined them together to create a new humanity in himself. Peter got to understand this very clearly. And so he's living like the Gentiles, he's eating like them. But as soon as these individuals came from Jerusalem who were still trying to keep the law, the Bible says he withdrew and he separated himself from them, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Fearing these Jewish Christians who were still trying to abide by the law. He gradually stopped associating with the Gentiles, he gradually stopped eating with them. Thus, he was to be blamed. Verse 13, Paul continues by saying, and the other Jews, they dissembled likewise with him. As a leader, they followed his example and began to do what he did. In so much, Paul says that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Now you have to understand how profound this is. Barnabas was a fellow worker with Paul. He was also an apostle. He would go around and specifically focus on preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He and Paul were equals in the gospel. Working together, traveling from village to village, city to city, country to country in the ancient world, preaching the gospel to Gentiles, establishing churches. And after they establish a church, they move on somewhere else. If there's anybody who understood that we ought not to be prejudiced against Gentiles and we ought not to treat them like they are less than in the faith, it should have been Barnabas. But the Bible says when Peter made that wrong move, some of the Jews as well as Barnabas himself, one of the apostles to the Gentiles, did the same thing. And so when Paul saw that, he had to rebuke Peter too his face there's so much we can understand from this when we as the older ones and the leaders teach foolishness make wrong moves and decisions it can affect even those who should know better 
It can affect the younger ones and they can perpetuate the error that we demonstrate or that we teach them. And so Paul, when he understood the gravity of this, he rebuked him publicly. There are times, brothers and sisters, where we have to respectfully disagree with and rebuke leaders publicly. There are times we have to be wise and cautious and pull them aside and correct them. But there are times when the truth and the gospel are concerned, where we don't want foolishness and error to be perpetuated, we have to correct the error publicly. If the error is done publicly, it is to be addressed and corrected publicly. Are you hearing me? Because it can affect and damage the gospel and many other things. And so Paul took it upon himself to correct and rebuke Peter publicly. Before I continue, are there any questions or any input so far? Feel free, if you have a question, to stop me. Raise your hand so that I can respond to it. Or if you want to say something, don't be shy. Please feel free to say something or what you're understanding. And of course, because the, 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 the goal and focus here is for all of us to understand what Scripture is teaching. Amen? Okay, so everybody's okay so far? All right, wonderful. And so in verse 14, Paul says, When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before all of them, If you, being a Jew, live according to the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live like the Jews? This was hypocrisy. Paul said they were not walking according to the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is that what you eat does not matter. It's based on culture, what you feel for, what you want. What you eat will not affect your standing with God. Unlike some people teach and some religions and denominations and churches teach, where you go a hell if you a piece of pork. And you can't drink liquor and this and that. According to what we're studying here and what scripture teaches in New Covenant faith, what you eat, no matter, it's up to you and your health and your conscience and your Christian liberty to freely eat where you want. You ever hear the saying, yam where your tummy can take? It's true if your tummy can take in yam it. <laughs> Of course, and if you can't manage it, let me alone. But no make nobody tell you, say, yeah, go to hell because you eat some Trenton. If you have some pork and some ham and some bacon, eh? eat where you can't manage. Yeah, man, let me give me two. And the crooks, the only thing me don't have is the grunt because me can't catch it. And the rope because I can't skew. Everything else, me, yeah, me. <laughs> From the head to the hoof. <laughs> Bring it, give me. <laughs> I'm free in Jesus. I mean, now nah, go a helper. So don't make nobody condemn you and tell you foolishness. As a believer, you're free. And that's why Peter here was eating with them. Yes. Brothers and sisters, in the ancient world, pork was a delicacy of the Gentiles and the Greeks. You know? mm -hmm. It was a delicacy, just like how we love it today. And so Peter was eating it too because he understood that he's free in Jesus. His salvation is not affected by these things. And so he was freely eaten. But now when these Jews came who were still trying to keep the law, he played the hypocrite. And he compromised the gospel. And so Paul says, if you being a Jew, living like the Gentiles, eating like them, and not like the Jews as you should, then why are you trying to get the Gentiles to be like the Jews? It's hypocrisy and it can't work. You're trying to build up the wall that Jesus tear down. Jesus already fulfilled the law and ushered in a new covenant in which these rules don't matter any longer. You understood this. You've been practicing this for some time. But now that you see these men, you have respective persons. 
and you want to start switch up your mode and switch up your action he says it's not in accordance with the truth of the gospel and it ought to stop he continues in verse 15 by saying we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And what he means here is that they should understand as Jews, and they understood as apostles, that the law can save. Works of the law here refers to everything the law says to do and to not do. It doesn't matter how good you practice what the law say. You can't, that can't save you. The law can't make anyone righteous. It can't make us justified before God. The law can't make God love you no more, no less. And so Peter says, we can't be saved and justified by the law, but by faith in Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified before God. Brothers and sisters, whether you worship on Saturday or Sunday, that can't save you and it can't condemn you. I wonder if you're listening to me. Whether you make claims to keep a Sabbath or not, it can't save you, nor can it condemn you. Whether you're faithful to your spouse or not, that can't save, nor can it condemn you. What justifies us is faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there are rules and principles as Christians we ought to follow, yes. And we read all about those in the New Covenant. There are principles that are all across the board. But even obeying and following those, they are not the basis on which we are saved. Are you hearing me? We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That's what saves. Keeping law can't save. Keeping law can't make us better. Keeping law could never make us righteous. In fact, we will see later on, Paul says, if law could have saved and make you righteous, you don't need Jesus. You could do it yourself. Go on in the car and do it yourself. You don't need Jesus. But as we know, brothers and sisters, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We all have sinned. We all deserve to die. There is none righteous. No, not one. Psalm 32 and Romans 3 tells us. And so there is no human being other than Jesus who could ever keep the law perfectly. That is why he had to come. And that is why the law can't save. Because we are already sinful and messed up. He came to take our place, die in our place, and he gives us his righteousness. And so our justification is by grace through faith in Jesus. Not a single soul can be justified by the law. And it's sad today that so many are trying so hard to be justified by the law. So many condemn the wider body of Christ who worship on Sunday, who don't pay lip service, the Ten Commandments and Sabbath and this and that. Uh, uh, because we, in their eyes, we don't keep the law. But the fact is we, we, we don't need to keep the law. In, in the first place, we were never given it. And in the second place, Jesus has fulfilled it, set it aside, and ushered in something new and better. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And so we're not bound to any strictures of the old covenant law. We have a new covenant in Jesus yeah. that operates much differently. In verse 17, he says, But if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ... We ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ then the minister of sin? God forbid. What he means by this is, as we seek justification from Jesus, but at the same time trying to be justified by the law and we're hypocritically going back and forth with it, is Christ the minister of sin? Is it Jesus that are making us hypocrites? That are telling us we are free from the law, but at the same time we're bound to it. He says, God forbid, and so it work. He continues by saying, if I build up again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. And the things that Paul was destroying was the prejudice and the separating wall and the segregation that existed between Jews and Gentiles as a result of the law. 
He was going around preaching and teaching, these things don't matter. Gentiles are now a part of the body of Christ by grace through faith in Jesus. But now Peter in his actions was rebuilding that. Peter was preaching the same thing too. But now he was building it back up in his actions. And so Paul says, you're a sinner. You're building up what Christ done tear down. You're rebuilding the wall that Jesus done tear down and remove. And then he continues by saying, for I, through the law, am dead to the law that I may live unto God. Brothers and sisters, the purpose of the law was never to save anybody, to justify and make anyone righteous. When you study the law properly, the law was to be a fence, a fence to keep the Jews in, to restrain their immorality. Notice every time in the Old Testament, whenever them broke out and go wild and stop following the law, how wicked they become. Apostate, apostasy and all kinds of foolishness they begin to do. And then a prophet will come, rebuke them, revive the law, and they start following it again, and they are back within the box of the law. Are you following me? The law was never an avenue to justify, not to save, like some are trying to use it for today. And they use it as a measuring stick. They look by you, and they look at what the Ten Commandments say, and if you fail in one point, then they condemn you to hell as a Christian. So, so what, what measures and determines your salvation for them is the Ten Commandments. And ultimately, it's not even all the Ten Commandments. It's just the Sabbath, the day you go to church or don't go. Even in some of them, in, in their eschatology, they have that the Sabbath is the seal of God, is going to determine the save and the unsaved in the end. And it, 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 it's crazy. They, they totally misunderstand the gospel. They have no clue of how we are saved in Jesus. And Paul here is saying, he died through the law in order that he might live unto God. We can't be alive to God and to the law at the same time. You see, when you're transfixed on the law in Romans 7, Paul says it's the law that teaches him sin, that evokes all kinds of sin in him. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56 says, the law is what empowers sin. That is why those who are transfixed on the law that their lives are often so messed up, they can't live above sin. They can't get the victory. The more they keep saying, keep the Sabbath, is the more they're breaking it. The more they're, they're focused on don't commit adultery, the more sexual immorality is rampant among them. The more they're focused on don't lie, is the more they might tell lie. That's what the law does. The law deceives and, and, and resurrects sin in us and makes us more sinful. The law beat us down to a pulp. And that's why we have to dead to it. We have to die to it in order that we come alive to Jesus Christ. You can't try to be alive to God and to the law at the same time. It can't work. In Romans chapter 7 verses 1 to 6, Paul uses the analogy of the husband and wife. You can't be married to the law and married to Jesus at the same time. You're either married to one and not to the other. But some are trying to have two husbands, the law and Jesus. Give me law and Jesus. Yep. Can I serve two masters? One or the other. So Paul says, and the, the reason he has to die to the law is because of what the law kept doing to him. Mash him up. So he had to die to the law. And when you're dead to something, you're unresponsive. When people physically and naturally dead here, they're not nothing to do what goes on in this life again. They're not still cooking their food and coming to church and walking up and down and breathing and, and wearing clothing. Are you listening to me? When you're dead to something, you become unresponsive. You have nothing to do with it. Paul says he had to die to the law in order that he might live to God. And brothers and sisters, what is important is for us to be alive to God and dead to the law. It can't be both. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He is living a new life. Not a life oriented to and focused on the law, but a life that is transformed by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. A life that is now characterized by Christ living in him, actuating him, propelling him, directing him, controlling him, moving him in directions that Jesus wants him to move. It's not a life where the law lives in him and it's the law that is determining his actions. He says, I'm crucified with Christ and it's not me who is living. It is Christ who is living in me and this is happening by faith. It's not happening by law. He says, it is by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And as we close for tonight in verse 21, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. We frustrate God's grace when we try to mix grace and the law. We frustrate the grace of God when we try to, to, to somehow corrupt it with law. We frustrate his grace when we try to initiate our salvific experience. We start salvation with grace and we're trying to continue and finish it with law. It can't work that way. In fact, as we go on in chapter 3, we will see where he talks about that next week when we come back to Bible study. We'll see where he talks about that. You can't start by faith and then one law take it over. The same way you start by grace through faith is how it will be finished. The same way we start is how we should continue and it's how we will finish. God does not save us by his grace and faith in Jesus. Then he let law take over thereafter. Remember we're dead to it. We know business but law. We now have no kind of obligation to the law. What we're under is the new covenant of grace in Jesus. And so, as I said again, don't make people come tell you foolishness. If you're not dressed like them and eat like them and, and subscribe to the law in whatever form, then, then you can't save or you're not a real Christian and you are going to hell. No, make them tell you foolishness. They are deceived. They don't know the gospel and they are lost where scripture is concerned. It is this very same heresy that Paul is dealing with here. Where people are trying to merge the grace of God and the law. And they were trying to shove the Galatians back under the law. After they had come to faith in Christ. And, and receiving the gospel and new covenant faith. They were trying to subject them back to the law. And Paul came out strongly and rejected that notion. So he says, I don't frustrate God's grace. Trying to be subject to law. And being focused on his frustrating grace. He says, I don't frustrate it, for if righteousness could come by the law, Christ died in vain. If we could keep the 613 commands of the old covenant law, if somehow we could muster up enough strength, enough courage, enough good behavior and practice to do them and eventually keep it perfectly and thus be righteous and saved before God, we don't need Jesus. Are you hearing me? But no one could do it. No one could do it. And that is why Jesus had to come. Paul says, if we could be righteous as a result of law, Jesus is useless, he's pointless. The main purpose of Jesus is because no one could keep law. So he came and kept it perfectly. He was the perfect lamb, perfect sacrifice in our place. He took our place and became sin for us. That we could become God's righteousness. And he imputes his righteousness to us. So that when we come to faith in him. God sees us like he sees Jesus. Perfect and spotless as if we've never sinned. And that is why brothers and sisters. Law keeping is not what can save or will save. It is grace through faith in Jesus. So Paul says, if righteousness could come by the law, we don't need Jesus. So all those who are trying to go back to the law, they need to stop, stop calling Jesus' name. They don't need him. 
because they could somehow try to do it themselves but of course they'll be miserable failures over and over because the fact is no one could keep the law perfectly and that is why we have Jesus absolutely James James chapter 2 uh, I think it's verse 12 where he says if you break one you're liable to all you couldn't pick choose and refuse the law whether it's a big one or a small one you you have basically violated all of it because the law demands absolute perfection 100% of the time you can fulfill 98% fail on two and say see at least I did 98 no the law requires a hundred percent perfection even when you're sleeping <laughs> Now who can do that? Even when you're sleeping, you have to be strictly perfect all the time. But that's impossible because we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Our very natures are sinful. In rebellion against God and we can't keep the law. So how can that ever work? And that's why Jesus had to come. So Paul says if righteousness could come by the law, Jesus died for no reason. And so Paul is speaking strongly here against what Peter did, what the Jews were doing then, and what a lot of these pseudo-Jews are trying to do where the law is concerned. And brothers and sisters, just as how Paul rejected such notions, we ought to reject them today. Take away yourself and your law. Give me grace on Jesus. Law can't save me. It's Jesus who saves me. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. It's not about the law, it's about faith in Jesus. And that's where we stand, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Sit on upon that, stand upon that, hold upon that, and don't make anybody tell you anything else. Amen? Amen. Amen.